Good afternoon, everybody, or good evening, depending upon where you are. Uh, it's Patrick from the Poison Pen Bookstore, and we are here with another of our virtual events. And today we have Jean Hanth Korolitz. Uh, she's going to be talking about her brand new book, The Plot. And Jean was uh, kind enough to sign a, night, a batch of copies for us, but they are dwindling. Um, there's a nice signature here. So uh, during the program, I'll go ahead and put a link in the comments field to our website if you'd like to order one of our last uh, signed copies. And our good friend, Joseph Finder is here and he's gonna be talking to Jean. Um, and Barbara is at her home office and I'm here at the bookstore. So it's a, it's a, a miracle of technology that we're all here today. <laughs> but I will, uh, as usual, I'll be monitoring the comments field. So if you have questions for Jean or Joe, Go ahead and put them in, and I'll reemerge towards the end of the program to ask some of your questions. So, Barbara, I feel like Lester Holt over here. Um, Barbara, I'm going to hand it off to you. Thank you, Patrick. I know we, we have this routine down, and I feel sometimes like it is almost feeling scripted at the moment, but it's actually not. It's spontaneous. So, I would like to say that this wonderful book, The Plot, is our May Crime Book of the Month which also explains why we have very few signed copies left, but don't miss it. Jean has had extraordinary reviews for this book. And I find it fun because when I spoke to her about it, she said she's, she's not really a crime writer, but somehow or other, <laughs> this book has really taken off in mysterydom. So since this is our first event with Jean, let me give you just a little background. She's the author of various novels, you should have known, which aired on HBO, as The Undoing with Nicole Kidman, Hugh Grant, and Donald Sutherland. You can hardly get a better cast than that. Uh, Admission, adapted as the film in 2013, starring Tina Fey, The Devil and Webster, The White Rose, The Sabbath Day River, and a jury of her peers, as well as uh, a novel for children and some poetry. But here's the thing I think is so cool about Jean, and she can do this in New York. We can't really do this easily in Scottsdale. In 2013, she created Book the Writer, a New York City-based service that presents pop-up book groups with prominent authors in private homes. Approximately 20 events are held each year and groups are limited to 20. And I will not break your heart with a list of authors that she has done yeah. this with. She's but, my but heroine. Online at the moment. I mean, we've, we've been online since last fall. So we, and I added summer programming this year for the first time. So we're gonna have great authors all through the summer and you don't have to be in New York. You can join us from anywhere. Well, there you are. So you might want to send Patrick the link for that or me, and we will publicize it because that's a wonderful thing. And it's a delight to see Joseph Finder again. It is Finder, not Finder. Let me <laughs> get that straight. Um, we've, been, we've been doing events with Joe for many, many years. He's the author of either 14 or 15. Is it 15 by now, Joe? 16. 16. Thank 16. you. Novels of suspense, including The Switch, a standalone thriller. And his novel, High Crime in 1998 and Paranoia in 2004, have also been adapted into major motion pictures. Um, and he's contributed to several story collections and his latest knowledge, sorry, his latest suspense novel for his series lead, Nick Hiller, Heller, I don't know why I can't talk, Nick Heller, is House on Fire. Joe has also got this wonderful resume. He's a founding member of the International Thriller Writers, a member of the Council on Foreign Relations, and the Association of Former Intelligence Officers. I mean, how cool is that? That's a great credential, Joe. Why don't I ever notice that? I mean, I think you that's know, the first time I've ever seen that. I want to know what your what your mother fed you because <laughs> you guys are such incredible high achievers. <laughs> yeah. Well, Henry's a genius, so. Well, uh, yeah. Henry, is, Henry is a really fascinating person. And I, I mean, I always love running into him when I, I haven't run into anybody in over a year, but yeah. when I used to run into him, I love seeing him. So give us a little deep background on why you belong to the former intelligence officers. Association. Yeah, I like to know that too. Oh, they uh, invite in people who write about intelligence, not just members of the oh. intelligence community. Uh, so I have written about the CIA and about Russian intelligence and Russia for a long time. And uh, I'm sort of a ringer in that group. Okay, that but makes sense. Non -spy. Yeah. I didn't know if you'd, you know, like serve time in Berlin or something and I just never knew it. 
Right. Yeah, that's great. So Joe, Joe is really experienced in um, in twisty plots and surprise endings. Um, I think of him as, as Boston's Jeffrey Deaver in, in a way. We had a great event with Jeffrey last Monday. And, you know, he's he's, he's all about the twist. In fact, his new book is called The Final Twist, which is an absolutely perfect title for a Deaver book. In any case, um, Gene has done an amazing thing with the plot. And um, it would be probably better if she gives you her summary of far as she can go. This is one of those books where it's really heartbreaking. We can't talk about the entire book. We can only talk because, but you know, increasingly we are finding ourselves wishing we could run book discussion clubs post events. Yeah. You know, like six, we've done a couple and we have one coming up with Jake Chapper and the missing David Baldacci. Um, but I'm thinking that it, it really, if we had the time, and time is, is a big issue, it would really be rewarding, you know, to do these launch parties, but then to go back maybe six weeks after wow. readers, <laughs> you know, I've read the book and, and, and do it all the way through. So I'm thinking that people are always saying, how are you going to go forward after the pandemic with a bookstore? And I'm thinking that that might be one way that we might go forward. I think it's a great idea. I did a, a podcast the other day and they said, after they finished it, they said, now we want to tape a, another 10 minute discussion where, where there are spoilers. And then they have that behind a paywall or something. So Good. I right. don't know. I think it brings out the entrepreneur and a lot of people, but, but you don't want to ruin it for any, everybody. And I, my son has a, a poster in his room that, uh, you know, Alfred Hitchcock with Psycho, no one is allowed to tell the, you know, what happens and you're not allowed to leave the theater until the end and all these rules that he had. Very good marketing probably. But. So you do say in the end of the book that your, your story, the plot is really hard on writers. And I think that's probably true, but what inspires you to write this book? And did you actually start out intending it to be a novel of suspense or did you start it out to, to be a good story in it? kind of took you in that direction? I, I, I've i written lots of novels. Not all of them have been published. Um, some of them took 20 years, literally 20 years of thinking about an idea before I started writing them. And there were two in that time that just kind of came out of nowhere, fully formed. Uh, one was You Should Have Known, which became The Undoing. And the other one was this. And uh, when I say fully formed, I don't really mean fully formed. I mean about 60% formed because I, I think it's, it's uh, you know, it's fatal to start writing a book where you know everything that's going to happen. I think there has to be some surprise there for us as we write. Uh, if we're not surprised ourselves, nobody else is going to be surprised either. So when I say I have this idea, I, I saw... The situation, I saw the theft, I saw the threat, I saw who was behind the threat, and I saw what the plot was. I mean, and those were huge, huge chunks of it. The connective tissue, um, bringing all those things together, that was for me to discover as I went. And, and, I, and I had to, there was a point during the writing of the book where I, I realized I'd gone wrong and I had to unravel and that's so painful. I'm sure Joe has had that experience as well. Sure. But, um, but remarkably little of that. And it, insanely, this book was written in about four months, which you know I never hope to experience that again because it was painful and dreadful and it required things like a pandemic going on in the world, which kept me, you know, pretty close to the grindstone. I really never, ever want to have that happen again. Jean, so, you, um, I read somewhere that you, uh, were, you sort of laid out the plot for your editor. Yeah. Tell us about well, that. What happened was, you know, it was a sad, sad story because it involved another novel, which I have been writing, have been working on for several years. And it's a very different novel from this. It's a big, multi-generational novel about a family and uh, you know lots of perspectives and a lot of stuff I'd never done before like multiple protagonists and it just wasn't quite there and she wouldn't buy it <laughs> and she kept saying I'm going to buy it but not yet I want you to you know do another draft and and I was having uh, a really painful meeting with her in her office uh, and actually it was the second or third time we'd have that meeting and she was telling me that uh, it wasn't ready. 
it wasn't good enough and you know it needed more work it, it, something wasn't working just the kind of you know meeting we all love to have with our <laughs> editors even though i you know i never doubted for a minute that she wanted the best for this book she wanted it to be better um and I, I know she believes in me and I know she wants to work with me, but it was still pretty depressing. And in the middle of this awful meeting, I just, I kind of heard myself say, I have another idea. And I just kind of spilled it all out. And it was the first time I even said it out loud. Out loud. It was the first time I'd even thought through the book from beginning to end. And I could see as I was telling her the story about this washed up writer and his horrible student and this plot that's so brilliant that anybody who writes this book is going to have a, a brilliant publishing experience. Um, I could see her get more and more excited. It was really thrilling for me. And I wrote, I, I walked out of the office thinking, well, at least, you know, there's a future here. And the next day my agent called me and she basically said, what the hell just happened? you're, you know, you're getting a, you just sold both books. And, um, you know, I've, that's never happened to me before. I've never had a two book contract and that kind of security meant, yeah. meant so much to me. And what my editor and I agreed um, very sensibly, I think was that I should put aside the novel that was not working, which I clearly needed some distance from and write this instead. And then later go back to the other one. And then everything shut down. And there I was, you know, in a very remote place in upstate New York with my husband. Uh, and there was nothing else to do um, except think about how hard, what, what was happening out there. And it was terrifying and I was furious um, at people I will not name for making this situation so much worse than it had to be. And I was scared, really, really scared. And I just wrote. I wrote constantly and four months later it was done. So um, it, it was there a was, fascinating you, experience. You, uh, when you told the, the idea, when you sort of laid it out for your editor, there was a point at which she gasped, right? Yeah, she gasped, she did. When I told her what the plot was, yeah. she gasped. I mean, and, and I've read a lot of novels, you know, I'm, I'm sure everybody on this call has read a lot of novels. I have never come across this thing in a novel. I've come across lots of shocking things, but I've never come across this thing. And that doesn't mean nobody, somebody else hasn't written it. Um, I've read it, a lot of novels, but I haven't read every novel. It's possible that it's out there, but if it is, I'm not aware of it. And you know, what's so funny. Um, in the last few days, I have been, actually I've been keeping a list of the different things that people have been suggesting this novel is copying. And, yeah. you know, anything that says, isn't this the plot of so-and-so? And I've got like eight things on the list already. And I mean, none of them are, but it, it, it almost proves the point that there are no new ideas under the sun and that everything that we write is a kind of um, repositioning and reconsidering and mishmash and mixtape of all of the stories that we've heard and we've read before. So when I when I get when I get enough of them, I'm gonna have my I'm gonna have my son record a <laughs> do he's an actor and do a recording of all of these. Isn't this the plot of let's see DOA? Isn't this the plot of um, uh, what was the other one? Oh, Death Trap by Ira Levin. Isn't this the plot of the words that that uh, uh, Bar uh, Bradley Cooper movie? You know, no, it's not. Jean, can we do something very basic and sort of talk about what the book is all about? Sure. We That's haven't done that yet, and I want people. This is this is one of my favorite books. Your this the plot. One of, I, probably my favorite book of the last several years. Oh wow! I think it's just really. And it's up there in terms of books about writing and the writing process and publishing and all that. It's sort of up there with Stephen King's Misery. Yeah. Uh, uh, you know, as yeah. So yeah. Anyway, tell us about, tell us basically about right. this. So uh, like most writers, I, um, I have a fascination with where stories come from, where ideas come from. I mean, there's no, it's no, uh, mystery that the, the number one question people ask us 
we can all say it together. So where do you get your ideas? Right. And, you know, Stephen King answered this question for everybody by saying, Utica, New York. Thank you, Stephen King. Now we don't have to answer this question anymore. But in fact, it is a mystery. We don't know uh, where the ideas come from. And the result of that for us, for the writer, is uh, a kind of deep-seated uh, anxiety over whether we, in fact, wrote our own work. <laughs> that, you know, that idea that we had, did we get it from, you know, the, a book we read when we were 12 or that character, did it come out of something that I picked up, uh, you know, on the shelf of a hostel in, in India? You know, they're all in there, all of those books that we've read and the campfire stories and the movies and, you know, what happened to great uncle Albert, it's all, like in a big cement churning mixture in our heads at all times. And when it comes out on the page, you can, it's very hard, not to say impossible, to really identify where things came from. And if you're a kind of neurotic writer, which a lot of us are, you know, you, you put this work out into the world, it's got your name on it, but deep down, you're not completely sure that you wrote it. And that is terrifying. So it's this basic anxiety that I drilled straight down into like Laurence Olivier in Marathon Man here. Um, in terms of the story itself, it's a story of a, a writer named Jake who uh, is not doing too well in his career. He had a small success with his first novel but he hasn't really produced anything very good since that. And um, he's, he's teaching in a pretty bottom of the barrel MFA program. And into his class walks that student, that horrible, you know, jerk, arrogant um, student who uh, basically announces that he doesn't need Jake. He doesn't need his fellow classmates. He doesn't need anybody because the novel that he's writing is in his own words, a sure thing. And it has such a brilliant plot that, um, you know, even bad writing can't kill it. And Jake, you know, thinks, well, this guy's an obvious loser and he's a jerk. But then in a private conference, the student actually tells him the story, the plot of this book that he's writing. And Jake is horrified to realize that he's absolutely right, that He's going to write this book. He's going to be a massively successful uh, writer. And it isn't fair, but, you know, there are rules about these things. And so he consigns this horrible guy to his success and he goes back to his own life. A few years later, he realizes that this book has never materialized and he does a little searching and he discovers that the student has died and not, not recently either. He's died pretty shortly after their encounter. And the minute he makes this discovery, you know, the other part of his writerly soul and pride uh, kind of wakes up because now there is this story and it's a story that is screaming at him to tell. He doesn't have any manuscript pages. He barely remembers the language that his student used. This is not a case of a plagiarized book. This is, taking the story the way, uh, you know, the way uh, Cold Mountain took the story of Ulysses, of, which took the story from Homer. These are stories that travel through our lives. We all dip into them and uh, whether we realize it or not. So he justifies it all. Um, and he does become wildly successful, but he can't really enjoy it because he's too terrified that somebody is going to come out of the woodwork and accuse him and then somebody does. And that is where we are. <laughs> That's where I'll stop. <laughs> mm -hmm. um, did you teach writing ever? I am such an ungifted teacher of writing. You would never want me to teach writing. Um, but I did for about a month when I was in my 20s, teach uh, an extension course at the University of Massachusetts at Amherst. Yeah. The stakes could not have been lower. I had four students and one of them was that guy. Yeah. That guy. Yeah. Yeah. And who came right back to me when it was time to describe this particular student. And I have since confirmed with my friends who teach 
um, creative writing that that guy is in every single class. Yeah, so. yeah. I I taught writing for five years, uh, and I've met those students before. Yeah, yeah. yeah. he's there. He, yeah. he, may have, he may have changed his name, but he's still there. <laughs> So do you believe there are only seven plots or whatever the number is? You know, I, I greater minds than mine have, have you know, <laughs> parsed that information. I think it's fascinating. I have never subjected those 3000 novels that I've read to, you know, are you in column A or column B? I mean, the obvious ones are pretty easy, but yeah, I, I, I guess it's a good, I think it's a pretty good argument that there are seven plots. Mm -hmm. And Stephen King said so himself. And if he said it, then it's true. Yeah. Yes. But does it matter? Does it really matter if there are only yes. seven plots? Because really really what it comes down to is, you know, what do you do with the plot as compared to Lee Child and I had a really interesting discussion about this a couple of weeks ago that, you know, you could take the same story and give it to 20 people and you would get 20 totally different books. Yeah. It would be different voices. It would be different characters, yeah. you know, whatever. So, you know, the plot is, is the thing that, that the you know structures the narrative, but in fact, you can get all different interpretations. And for some reason, and I'm not really sure what, um, and maybe it's prompted some of the questions that you've gotten. There are a number of books out about people writing and you know taking their idea, or somehow the idea comes to them. Yeah, and, and I somebody else, the late Philip Kerr, wrote a really good book about that. And there's a number of them. There's also some metafiction that's out um, and, and I actually have edited a really great one that's coming out next year um, about, about writers, but it's, um, there's, there's one called After She Wrote Him, which is truly fabulous, which is about a writer who eventually falls in love with her character, but the character falls in love with the writer, but then there's an obstacle in the way and you're in one mind or the other so. All the time. No, it's really a terrific book. Um, okay, and so right. I, I think what it is is people are just fascinated with the whole all the whole process of writing, yeah. as you've already pointed out. And when that fascination meets our Achilles heel of of this deep, deep anxiety over whether we are in fact plagiarizing with every word that we write, you get this kind of a, a wonderful playground. But is it plagiarizing? I mean, plagiarizing to me means you've just copied it. But is it plagiarizing if you have an idea and you run with it in a different way? Joe, what do you think? I, I, I would say they're very different, but there seems to be a lot of confusion about it out there. Yeah, 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 yeah. I think, I think Lee's point is right, too, that uh, every writer is going to do something very different with an idea, mm -hmm. right? Uh, if I stole this idea from Jean, I would write a very different book. Exactly. And, and you'd have different characters and you, yeah. your voice. You know, I, I, you and I have talked about this. I read for voice. You know, yeah. I mean, if you're boring, I, I've always said that when I was an acquiring editor, I used to say that. I say, you know, I can help you with plot. I can help you develop character. But if you're boring, I can't fix it. You know, right. that's the one thing a great editor can't do. Yeah. Or even a not great editor. But don't um, be boring is what you would say. Don't be boring. Yeah, but we all know people like that. You know, you go into a room and you know you bond with some people and other people you find boring. And and I think for readers it's the same way. In the universe of books, some of them speak to you and some of them don't. Uh, yeah. Uh, yeah. Um, I wonder, Jean, whether you believe that writing can be taught. <laughs> It's an excellent question. I mean, as you know, I am married to somebody who teaches creative writing. He seems to feel that um, you can teach reading, you can teach people to be better readers and that, you know, hopefully some of that migrates into their own, um, I, I'm, I'm, I'm pausing because I'm trying to avoid using the word process, a word that I despise, but that, that it will somehow migrate into the ways in which they make their own writing. Um, I, I don't know, you know, I, I didn't get an MFA, but it's not like I was working down in the mines for those years that I wasn't in an MFA program. I was over in England doing a completely unnecessary two year graduate course during which I did a lot of reading and a lot of writing. So, um, it wasn't because I didn't believe writing could be taught. Mm -hmm. And I, I have many friends who have gotten MFAs and they love their time there and they use their time there and they, 
they yeah. had great fellowship with other writers. So I don't mean to be down on the MFA programs, but um, this this the particular MFA program in this book is it's, not so great. I would say it's a horror show. Yeah, it's yeah, really it's bad. Yeah, yeah. I've always thought that it was like that. The teaching writing is like teaching voice, mm. um, where you can teach people who have a voice, who can sing, who can hold a tune. Um, and those who can't, you can't, cannot be taught. Yeah. Yeah. That would be me, by the way. <laughs> <laughs> I would love to be able to sing, but no, it's not going to happen. So Jean, have you been surprised by um, how people have reacted to the book? Did you expect um, people to think of it as a, as a, let's call it a novel of suspense? Or what, what, who are you writing it for? Anybody in particular or just writing it because you love the story? I, I've been bouncing back and forth over the uh, suspense literary line since I began. I mean, I, I wrote two uh, literary novels that were not published and then I kind of said, now I'm gonna write something that somebody will publish. And I wrote a legal thriller and it was the 1980s and Scott Turow was uh, doing his work, starting his work. And I, I mean, I, it was such a kind of, it was such a cut and dry decision. I am going to write a legal thriller. I am so tired of writing novels that nobody will publish. And uh, ever since then, I have been uh, kind of bedeviled by this notion of, of uh, genre because People would like a book that had a lot of plot, that had a crime, that had a, a trial, and then I would insist on writing a, a more literary book, and I would sort of lose all of those uh, great new fans, and they would get disgusted. And but I couldn't help it because you know I don't know about you, Joe, but I am a one person, one plot at a one book at a time yeah. person. I don't have a series lined up. I don't have five great ideas at one time. I have one. And if it's a literary novel, I'm writing a literary novel. And mm -hmm. if it has this kind of propulsive plot, um, that's what I'm writing. I, I'm, I'm really quite helpless about it. So who did I write it for? I mean, look, at this point, I, at this point, I feel like people, if they don't like my work, I, I beg them to stop reading it because like with every book, I'm, I see comments like, I just can't stand the way she, this is my fourth novel that I've read by her and I just can't stand the way she writes. Please, I beg you, stop reading my work. It's not gonna change. I know I use a lot of parentheses. I use a lot of dashes. I, I know I do, I'm sorry. That's just, I'm not Hemingway, okay? But, um, but the, this is it. This is how my brain works. And sometimes it goes in more of a, of, of a propulsive plot driven direction. And sometimes it slows down. And it's more about the language and the people. Kind of can't help it. Yeah. And um, um, You Should Have Known, I thought, was another terrific story. Uh, and that I was surprised at the adaptation and how different it was. Yeah. I didn't expect it. I mean, I. Yeah. I read the book, I loved it, and I, I liked The Undoing a lot. I thought that was really, it's really well done. But yeah. it felt, why was it so different, do you think? You know, I think, uh, I think David E. Kelly was very interested in the characters and the situation. Mm -hmm. um, but it's, it's a very internal novel. It's really about what's going on in Grace's head and that you know, it doesn't matter how, how close the camera gets to Nicole Kidman's eyeball, you still can't go inside her brain and see what's going on in there. So um, I remember he said to me very early on, uh, Jonathan is going to be in this story. I mean, Jonathan in the novel is barely there. I mean, I, I think I got him down to a text message. And if I could have gotten rid of that text message, I would have done that too. Every, with every draft, I took him out more and more. Mm -hmm because I'm not interested in him. I mean, I'm interested in him as a, a, a guy who does really repulsive things, but the book is about her. So when he said, you know, Jonathan's gonna be in the story, plus we've cast Hugh Grant, and right. you don't cast Hugh Grant to play a character that's not there. I mean, I knew, I knew that yeah. uh, it was gonna go in a different direction and I just tried to be very Zen about it. And it helped that it was such a fun and, thrilling and exciting story that he made. 
But afterwards, when people would say, wow, how did you come up with that plot twist? Like, I didn't, you know? Yeah. <laughs> You're talking about something David E. Kelly wrote. Um, mm -hmm. So mm -hmm. yeah, I mean, if you've had work uh, adapted, you you know, you just have to let go. You gotta unless, let go. Unless you're writing it and directing it. Yeah, you just hope it's gonna be a good adaptation. Yeah. Not necessarily a faithful adaptation. Yeah. You want it to be sort of faithful to its genre, really. Yeah, and I, I think it was, and, and I didn't know who did it in the, in the undoing. I mean, they, they so kindly sent us the, um, the first five episodes. And this was very early in the pandemic and we were all able to kind of link up our screens and my parents were watching it in New York and my kids were watching it in New York and we all watched it together and it was very fun. Um, but they wouldn't show us that sixth episode. <laughs> they were like, <laughs> you're not getting that. So I, I literally saw it with everybody else. And I, I didn't, I thought that Sylvia did it. So there you go. Mm -hmm. What am I doing? Right. Yeah. Yeah. You've had actually good luck with Hollywood, I think, um, between The Undoing and Admission, which the Tina Fey movie, uh -huh. which is a, a very nice movie. It's um, a very sweet movie. And yeah. I, I'm still friendly with the, uh, the screenwriter, Karen Croner. She emailed me mm -hmm. uh, yesterday, actually. Um, but that was the first lesson in sort of handing over your baby and saying, you know, Hope you grow up and go to college, but it's not, it's not up to me anymore. Oh, yeah. To college. Um, yeah, very sweet movie, very different from the book also. Mm -hmm. but what are your thoughts about long form television versus a film? Do you feel that, you know, I I mean, if, if, if the plot, would, would it, do you feel be better suited to five or six episodes or would it be better as a, what, what are movies run, 120 minutes roughly? Yeah. Which, oh, which would be better? It's a moot question because it is going to be one of those things. And that's, that's unfortunately, that's all I, I can say at this point. But whether I think it would be better at one or the other, it's, it's out of my hands now. And I, I think it's, I, I really like the people who are working with it. And I'm sure they're going to do a fantastic job. Mm -hmm. Oh, that was an academic question. I didn't expect a real answer. So <laughs> you never know where do you, where do, you do that. And, and uh, you know, during the pandemic, I, my husband and I kind of, we did a, a deep dive and we watched stuff we'd never seen before, like The Sopranos and Boardwalk Empire and, and uh, Borgen. And we just loved it. I mean, we're, we're very grateful for this work. If you watch Call My Agent. Loved it. Oh Love. God! I think "Call My Agent" was just beyond yeah. brilliant. Yeah. It got us through. It got us through the election and the horrible yeah. follow-up. You know, because we could just like step off into "Call My Agent." And there's there's some wonderful um, MHC is a um, foreign language primarily, and I absolutely love this stuff. And they have a series um, filmed in France called "Murder In" and then an ellipsis. And every episode, they go to another fabulous part of France, and you know they're using historic buildings, and they're doing, and they're all discrete, you know, discrete as an R E T E episode. So there's no through plot line, but it's been a tour of France like I've never had before as a French major. So you know, I, I love that. Um, and there's just been so many things to explore. Uh, David Attenborough's thing about color the other day which we watched was wonderful i try to put in some nonfiction occasionally just to break it all up and you know i'm so impressed that national geographic and some people have done these amazing things i think the pandemic in many ways has allowed us to explore things that we were just too busy running around yeah. i was too busy running around i i think that's true and uh i kept my book the writer events online and and i think people were very grateful um yeah. to have that ability to to continue to talk about books. Conferences have been very successful online. Um, mm -hmm. The Arizona Kidney, uh, the, the Kidney Foundation here, the uh, Women's Board Author Lunch is going to be online again this year, and they've they've snagged Ken Follett, which was never going to happen. Really, you know, in real well, yeah, because he doesn't have to come here. You know? Right, right. He's going to be doing like fifteen minutes with Adriana Trigiani or whatever it is, you know, and. It does let us do some really great things um, and assemble people that were was never going to happen um, physically. And so I, I'm hoping we can keep all the good parts of this. 
even though I really want to go back to live events. We miss the customers. We miss the energy in the store. I miss taking you to dinner, Joe. I mean, yes. That was always part of the deal, right? You know, that was the exactly. after party here at, at the Poison Pen. Our exactly. restaurant has survived, so I'm really pleased about that. Great so, restaurant. Joe, actually, since I brought that up, are you working on anything at the moment? I am, yeah. I'm on draft two of a book right now. Oh, that's so exciting. Is yeah. it a standalone or an $8? It's a standalone. Okay. Yeah. Well, you, you and I don't want to talk about it. You what? What's that? I, I just said I don't you... want to talk about it. <laughs> oh, no, I, I get you. But, I mean, no. you do. You do like to break up, Nate, with other things. Yeah, yeah. I just sort of, I had an idea for a standalone and it grabbed me and, you know, um, I get a lot of email from fans saying, when, when is the next Nick Heller book coming out? What's taking so long? Yeah, and, that's you know, the problem. I, I, mean, write it. I completely um, adore Thomas Perry. And every yeah. time one of those Jane Whitefield books comes out, I, you know, I walk, don't run to the, but right. as soon as it's over, I'm like, where's the next? <laughs> right. I love Tom Perry too. He's done events with us. We have launched Tom Perry's books for 20, maybe 25 years now. Not long ago, last year, I just love him. I said to him, because it, the only date we had was like a Thursday, which is not the day that you want to launch a book, right? I mean, you want to do it Monday or Tuesday. So I said, to him, what are we doing? I said, why is it? That we're doing this on th i can't remember why either he or we couldn't do it on monday or tuesday i said so why are we launching your book on thursday and he said well because until i come to the store and talk to you i don't know what to say about it so <laughs> basically i have to come and start there so that i can take that and you know go around and um and tour everywhere else which i thought was the nicest compliment might be one of the nicest compliments we've ever had that's great and yeah. he has a wonderful mind for you know, ingenious fraud. and But he's about process, isn't he? And I know you hate that word, but when I say process, what I mean is his books are about how things work. You know, Jane Whitefield escaping people, you know, leading them and all. He's just fascinated with how things work. And and I, it's, it's a joy to follow him when he's, when he's doing that. He leads you and, you know, there you are. I just love that he's yeah. always thinking. She's always thinking. She has to be always thinking because somebody's always trying to kill yeah. her. But. I love the book where he actually got an Ojibwa person to who had, a fan who had written to him over the course of years. He got him to, um, or the man volunteered, I don't even remember how it went. Anyway, the book about Jane that was really much more about Jane and her, her family origins and who she was rather than her you know, disappearing somebody. And I thought that was a wonderful addition to the series. So Joe, um, you know, when, when you do a standalone, is it because, in part, is it because that story won't fit the Nate Heller that you've created? Yeah, I mean, the, the stories that I come up with for the Nick Heller series, um, they're all investigative. And we all know that Nick's not gonna die. And Nick's, right. We also know that his life will not be upended because you can't do that with every, with every book in a series character. So the stories where someone's life is completely upended um, demand standalone books. They're just very different stories. So if an idea comes to me and it is, uh, and it involves a character who, you know, I love, I love doing this. I love taking ordinary people and placing them in you know, extraordinary circumstances. And uh, those kind of stories work better as standalones yeah. in the series books. Well, I agree, because you can't betray the character that you've created. You can't right. have him have been X and Y and then suddenly turn around and say, no, 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 I didn't mean it. He was really Q all along. Right. You know, and then, and right. also, then you could never go back to him if you right. did that. Yeah, you'd use it up. You can't do it that way. Yeah. So, Jane, all of your books have been all of your books have been standalones, right? Me? Oh, absolutely. So but, you haven't really had to to think about that, you know? Well, I mean, there are even the that first novel that I that was published, A Jury of Her Peers, I had to leave that publisher because they wanted me to, you know, immediately write a sequel with the same character, and I said, no, I mean, she's dead to me. I'm. I'm on to this other thing now. They they were like, well, then we don't want to work with you anymore. So it was a, it was a pretty early indication that I was not going to be going down that path. 
Yeah. That's what's so wonderful about writers. You know, I've always, it's interesting to me, fans in the store or questions that we've gotten from Zooms, and we'll pull Patrick up here in a minute to tell them, are so interested in knowing um, about how you write as though, as though somehow that's a magic key, you know, to yeah. if you do you write from eight to five or, you know, or are you using a typewriter or a pen or something, is there somehow all of that will translate? But it doesn't. I mean, every writer is unique. Yeah. And how, how you write is unique to you. And, and there isn't really any transfer. I think craft can be taught in answer to that question that you had a long time ago. And, and your analogy about voice, if you have a voice, you know, then somebody can help you train it or, or do things with it. But if you don't have a voice, right. there you are. It, you can't learn. Yeah, yeah, and I, I think that the, the real advantage to um, MFA programs and so forth is to help people learn craft. But if you basically go back to boring, if you're basically boring and can't, you know, then nothing's really going to help. Um, right. I'm also fascinated that some people only have one book in them, but that's a whole other discussion. But, you know, I've, I've always been interested in the one book writer or as we discussed with Dennis Lehane and Gillian Flynn, the paralyzing effect that a truly mega hit can have on you okay. as a writer, because that's another whole question. I am now looking back from book number seven. I know it's, I know you've written twice as much, but I feel, you know, quite old with the stack of seven novels. And when I think back to the beginning, when I was, you know, I had a lot of envy as a young writer because a lot of my contemporaries seemed to just sail into print and, they got a lot of uh, attention and a lot of uh, approval uh, while I was not able to get a book published. And now many of these writers are, are gone. I mean, they, mm -hmm. some of them managed to produce second novels, but most didn't. And I mean, it's incredible that I'm still here, you know, seven novels later. And I'm just so grateful to, well, frankly, to my, agent for continuing to believe in me and also uh, my editor who continued to ignore my terrible sales figures and you know I guess was able to persuade you know the higher ups that it, it was worthwhile to throw me a little money for the next book. You're, you're um, I think you said in an interview that you um, are sensing a temperature difference well, yeah, this feels very different from any other publication that I've ever had. Tell us about that. Tell us about um, that. You know, I, 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 I haven't quite known whether to trust it or not because these are strange times. And okay. for most of the year, uh, the last year, I've, as I said, been in an old house in a very remote place. And yet I sense, uh, you know, there was so much kind of buildup about the plot that I have never experienced before. Mm -hmm. I've had, you know, oh, uh, we think it's going to get reviewed in the New York Times. Hey, that's fantastic. But this, um, this was just kind of stunning and wonderful yep. uh, thing that I could watch in real time on Instagram. I mean, uh, they certainly put the galley of this book into the hands of many, many people on Instagram. Yep. But, you know, you can lead a horse to water. You can't make them like the book. And people really are liking this book. Yeah. And that is incredibly gratifying. And I, you know, I am a kind of always look for the the, the bad side of things. But <laughs> um, I'm always expecting, you know, to, you, know, you know, nothing will happen at the end. They, they just sent free books to all these people who now won't buy the book. I actually thought that last week. But yeah. that doesn't seem to be happening. In this case, people are kind of liking the book for itself and that's incredibly gratifying and, and yeah so. it's a word of mouth business right so it is and, and you know think about your guy jake i mean you've just actually described a lot of jake and and the situation that he was in is you know in your own life i find that really interesting i feel incredibly supported by my publisher and that's something that i probably have never that is a that is a phrase that has never passed my lips <laughs> <laughs> books. Um, I've certainly yeah. been well edited and I've been kind of praised but I think that the the feeling for the last six for the first six books was you know we'll throw it out there and if something great happens that'll be terrific but 
this is the first time that there was any kind of intention about that. And Celadon is really supporting the book yeah. and publishing it in a great way. And yeah. the publicity is terrific. And it's, yeah. uh, and it, it, and it all would, it, it only happens because the book is there because it's a sort of book that people love and, and tell other people about. Yeah, very true. I plucked it off the shelf and you know, there I went. Um, yeah. So I'm a speed reader. So I, I sat down and I just read it, you know, in a couple of hours. And, and that's a different reading experience. Well, you know that, Joe. Yeah, I know. You know how many books I read a month? It's absurd. Yeah. Um, and, and also, I, I don't always, you know, finish every book because I have to do book triage. I'm looking across the room at like 400 arcs, you know, I'm going, really? Uh, yeah. But this one I picked up and, and just did a total dive into it. And, um, and it, it really, it really, it's a book I'm glad I could read that way because, you know, to keep it all in your head, it helps if you didn't pick it up and put it down and pick it up and put it down. It's a different reading experience when you just, you know, read the book. Um, right. So lucky me. Why don't we call Patrick up and see if there are people who have questions or comments they would like to make or Patrick, who's actually a very good editor and a terrific reviewer, may have questions of his own about this whole thing. Oh, thanks. Um... Let's see, uh, there's a question for Jean from Amber. She says, um, would you ever do a continuing character? And if not, why not? I actually did it, but nobody noticed. Um, <laughs> this is what I mean by the books not being particularly well read. I, I wrote a novel called The Sabbath Day River. I'm, I'm in my office here, so I've got them all here. This is The Sabbath Day River. It came out in 1999. And it was about a character named Naomi Roth. And, and that actually, this, the Sabbath Day River actually was a bit of a crime novel. It surrounded a crime. And then uh, 20 years later, I wrote this book, The Devil and Webster. And Naomi Roth is now a college president. Um, and I just kind of left it there. I mean, I didn't think anybody would even notice, but a few people did email me. And, oh my God, it's Naomi Roth. She's back. You don't need to have read the first book, but... As soon as I conceived of, 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 of the Devil and Webster, which is set on a college campus and has a lot to do with uh, identity politics, I knew it was Naomi. I knew she'd come back. So I did it, but nobody noticed. <laughs> not too many people noticed. Before so we got started, I'm not against it. Before we started, I mentioned that I that I was a fan of your of your husband, Paul Muldoon. And um, I saw in here that you wrote a, uh, a play with him. Is that right? Yes. Uh, the did. Dead, 1904. You wrote this. <laughs> I'm this assuming is, that's uh, based on the James Joyce story, yeah, right? It's, it's an adaptation of uh, James Joyce's novella, The Dead. And we wrote it as an immersive theater piece so that, as many of your uh, audience will know The Dead is a classic Irish novella set in Dublin in 1904, and it takes place at a party um, on the Feast of the Epiphany in Dublin. And we wrote it as an immersive theater piece so that um, the, the audience were actually at the party and they're moving among the actors. The actors are you know, doing the play in, in the round, so to speak, and everybody's drinking and everybody eats this feast. And then at the end of the night, we follow the main characters upstairs into their bedroom. And for this kind of very powerful, beautiful language that is some of the most beautiful language Joyce or anybody ever wrote. Um, it was great. We did it for three years with the, Amer uh, with the Irish Repertory Theater. And then we lost our venue, which was um, the most important piece of that ability to put that on. So we're, we're still looking and hoping that we'll have a chance to put it on again, because it was just so much fun and people really wow. loved it. Isn't it astonishing to think about how old Joyce was when he wrote that? Yeah, it was like, it like 20 or something. Impressed as a writer, yeah, yeah. <laughs> And then he went on to write that little, you know, thing called Ulysses and <laughs> his wake. So yeah. Um, let's see here. There was a there was a, a uh, there was the inevitable question about your uh, writing process. <laughs> um, do you have one? We won't um, call it process. What are your yeah, habits? My my habit is to not write, and unless I'm 
I have something to write. So there are these long gaps between books. And it took me a long time to stop disrespecting those quiet periods because you need time, especially if you write like novels. And I think it's different for poetry um, or maybe short stories, which I've never written. You need time for those ideas to bubble up. And then when they reach a kind of critical moment, then that becomes the most important thing that you're doing. Um, then if you have a pandemic, you just basically write. But I mean, the, the usual amount of time that it takes me to write um, a good first draft is uh, 18 months or so. This was four months, but as I say, it was special circumstances. How about you, Joe? You want to answer that question too? In terms of my process, or in terms of how long it takes me to write a book? Whatever, uh, yeah. I have, written, I have written a book in as short as three months and I've written a book that's taken me two or three years. So um, I'm not like our friend Lee, Ch Lee Child, who starts on September 1 and finishes in, on March 15th and has a book. Um, I'm, I, I can't do it that way. For whatever reason, I can't do it that way. Um, I'm more like, like Jean is saying, where you've got to be grabbed by the idea and different ideas take different amounts of space, take different amounts of time. Makes sense. Yeah, I mean, you know, I'm, I'm trying to remember when, when did you first publish? What was your first, it was a long time ago. My first novel was published in 1991 called The Moscow Club. That's right, because we opened the store in 1989 and I was pretty sure that you published shortly after that's right. Um, after that. So, you know, nearly, nearly 30 years. Um, but, you know, you haven't, as you say, done a book a year. Um, no. um, and that comes back to our point that every writer writes differently. <laughs> right. Yeah. Andrew? Yeah. A question, another question from Amber. She says, Jean, how closely did The Undoing follow your book? The first two episodes of The Undoing were pretty close. And then it, it, Basically, as soon as as soon as Hugh Grant is back on the screen, it's not my book anymore. It's a different story. Um, although I will say that it returned somewhat in that last sixth episode. But ah, the hidden episode. sixth episode, the one you didn't get to watch. Right. Um, I, if you loved The Undoing and you are thinking, well, there's no point in reading you should have known because I saw the undoing. You know, it's a different book. And there are there are other twists. I mean, there are other surprises in the undoing. They may not have the wallop of helicopters and you know absconding fathers and sons, but it, there are there are other surprises to compensate one hopes. What 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 is the name of your feline friend that is on the couch there? Oh, that's Peter. <laughs> that's Peter. He's a uh, he's a pretty chill cat. There's also a dog here, but he's he's. Uh, let's see. I can. Yeah, that's Sherlock. Yeah, Sherlock and Peter. Uh, our good friend Daniel Palmer is watching, and he says, uh, uh, "Gene, do you read your reader reviews? Jake seems a bit indifferent to them, and curious if you are as well." He um, says, "I love this book so much, and I'm spreading the good word." Thank you, thank you so much. I'm afraid I have been reading them. I mean, I, I started reading them on Goodreads uh, when all those early galleys went out because I, I was, you know, part of me was like, are they wrong? Are they all wrong about this? You know, when, once real readers start reading it, are they gonna agree with my editor and all the nice people at my publisher? Um, so it was a great relief that, you know, right, right, off from the get-go, people were clearly liking it a lot. I had never heard the term slow burn, and I have now read this term in, I would say, 99% of the reviews. So I mean, the first time I heard it, I was like, um, maybe I should look up what that means, uh, but maybe I can already figure out what it means. But I don't, I don't find that problematic because, I mean, I think of my novels as sort of like a you know, a roller coaster, but if we all, if you know how a roller coaster begins, you know, there's that kind of long, slow chug yeah. uphill and then all hell breaks loose. And that, that's what I want. I mean, I, I in your novel that I recently read, you know, a, a judge has, commits an indiscretion while she's in a, away from her family. And you, 
you know, we know what's going to happen. And so we mm-hmm. don't even have to read the, 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 the what's on the back cover to know what's going to happen. Right. And in your mind, you're saying, don't do it. Don't do it. Don't do it. Um, but you need that long, slow buildup. Yeah really to, to not only to get to know the character, but to understand why what happens is so devastating. Right. Right? So right. it's a slow burn, apparently, a new literary term that I now am very familiar with, but did not know a few weeks ago. There's a good question for actually for both of you, um, which is how do you develop names for your character? You want to take that one? Is there any rhyme or reason to it? Or? Go ahead, Jane, go ahead. I, I feel like if you waste a name, it's a real wasted opportunity. Um, uh, I, I can't say that every name has high wattage, but you know, to, to name a character Joe Smith, you better have a really good reason. I, I think a name is a way of communicating something about uh, about the character. So I do think very carefully. I, I have this. Smith College yearbook from the 1950s. And sometimes I go to that for good names. How about you, Joe? I look at the Boston phone book, actually. There's some great names in the Boston phone book. The, the truth is that I, I will meet someone or hear a name and I will write it down. I have a list of great names that I want to use at one point or another. And um, the characters' names are really important to me. Mm-hmm. Um, and I need to, and I have, and in some cases, changed them halfway through because if they didn't feel like a, a Nick or didn't feel like a Sarah or whatever it is. The names are, they have this kind of totemic importance to the writer. I can give you a wonderful story from David Morrell, who, as you know, taught um, MFA and then wrote Rambo, which became whatever. But anyway, um, David was because he had sold the rights to Rambo, um, he ran into a problem when he was writing a book in which it was too close to, to the Rambo idea and so forth. And he, he realized that he was going to have to do something to make it different. And after some thought, he just changed the name of the character. And when he changed the name of the character, the whole book shifted and he was able to then, to then write it. And I thought that was that was such a really interesting thought. So names really do have enormous emotional freight. Yeah, yeah. Uh, let's see here. Okay, Pat has kind of a, a funny question. I think this is for Jean, but maybe it's for Joe as well. And it is, uh, do you worry about the competition from new voices? Ah, <laughs> uh, no, no. <laughs> love new voices I'm I you know at, at, at this at this late stage of my career there's no point in worrying about anything like that I mean I, I wasted enough time being competitive when I was in my 20s and had a reason to be upset about it but I you know I, I think that the only thing that we have to do is write the best book that we can and keep going and yeah. believe those things are so hard yeah. that to to pile on anything else is just ridiculous. So write the best book you can, keep going. That's enough for a lifetime. Yeah. And and it's, it's exciting to read a great book, to discover a great book, uh, to discover a great a new writer. Um, I, I'm not wary of new voices. I'm sort of excited by them, you know? because of the possibility that a really good book might come out of this. Well, we are too. And, you know, we've, we've lost a lot of writers, um, not just to the pandemic, but, you know, through normal attrition and so forth. And so it's a question we often know who is going to, you know, um, who is it that people will read who are fond of so-and-so and now that writer is no longer writing. So I think, I think new, we have for 30 years, new voices is what we've lived for. Right. In a, way, in a way, Jean, you're a new voice for me because actually I'm not that I'm, familiar with I'm a new voice and there are six more novels that you can read if you like this one. Well, but I, I I'm always looking for old voices that, you know, writers who have disappeared that, uh, yeah. I mean, when I, I, I like lists of great new books as much as anybody else, but what I really like 
is to hear from writers what what is the book that you just love that nobody else has ever heard of some writer who's just completely gone i i actually have a a very little uh instagram account called books of yesteryear and it's just the old books that i'm reading i mean everything from the 1970s back to the 18th century that that have disappeared i just love those give us a give us a few Oh, it's very embarrassing, but the one I just, I don't think I've even put it up yet, but the one I just read was a novel from the 70s called The Flesh Peddlers. And on the spine, it, uh, I, it was really hard to find this book. I had to go to like a used book dealer. On the spine, it says, reading for men. <laughs> <laughs> it was about a, 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 a talent agency in Los Angeles. So it was a, it was a kind of weird book about it a mid-century talent agency. But I mean, I'll find them at flea markets and I'll find books from you know the 19th century that by a writer I've never heard of and I'll take them home and I'll actually read them. Mm -hmm. So this is what I like to do in my non-existent spare time. I'm gonna give you both a book to read that I thought was the most original and arresting first novel that I read last year. I am absolutely an evangelist for it. It's called Fresh Water for Flowers and it's by a French author who, um, who's been translated into English. I have never read a book like it. I've never read a book with those voices and I have never read a book quite with that structure. And I, do you remember the, the name of the author, Patrick? Uh, uh, Perrin or Perrin? Yes, Valerie, Valerie Perrin, P-E-R-R, -R no, Perrin, but Valerie. Anyway, P-E-R-R-I-N, I think it's published by, I'm trying to remember if it's Europa. Europa, Europa. Europa. Yeah, but fresh water for flowers. If you want a really different reading experience, read it. I've I've already written it down. I absolutely loved it. It's just come out in paperback. What I live for. I mean, I I I just love, and it's it it's something that reassured me during all the years when nobody was reading my work that the books are there. You know, you can find them. You can you know you can find them in a library sale. You can find them on Amazon. You can find them in the dusty back you know, uh, shelves of the bookstore, they're not going anywhere. I mean, luckily nobody's burning them or pulping them. And I've discovered wonderful books that um, along the way that um, gave me so much pleasure. So when you write a book, it's it's not like it's a cream pup and it's gonna go bad in a few days. This- That's very true. Yeah, they never spoil on your nightstand for sure. Patrick, do you have a wrap up question? Cause we're probably yeah. beginning to test people's ability to sip. Yeah, actually, Daniel Palmer has one. He says, uh, um, let's see, one more question. Would you have done what Jake did if you were in those same circumstances? Ooh, good question. Okay. okay, so this is interesting. Um, I, I realize that I have answered this question both ways. I have said, no, I absolutely would not. And in a different interview, I realized I said, yes, I would. And I guess, I guess what that, shows me is that I am Jake, I don't know, but I am, it's an open question for me. I don't think what he did was wrong, but I think he thinks that the perception of it is so bad and he's afraid of that and I would be too. Yeah, I would be too. Joe? So yeah, I'd do it, sure, I'd take it. <laughs> um, <laughs> Yeah, and I, I uh, Jake wouldn't do it because Jake Jake was afraid in in the book of being caught. Um, that's not reason enough to do it. I just sort of feel uh, there are so, there are only so many original ideas. There are a million different spins on these original ideas. Um, uh, I would I wouldn't have a problem doing. It. Sure, I would. Yeah. I think you could take the position that, you know, it's a great story and mm -hmm. you shouldn't let it die. And so yeah. if it turns out that you're the person who's going to convey that story and not the, you know, the person you heard it from, um, it's, a you know, it's it's different than plagiarism is copying. And, and plagiarism you know, you is really people, make a distinction. People who plagiarize should be boiled in oil. I just want to go on record saying that. Okay. <laughs> well, that's a great way to end this. I like that. That's a really wonderful sign off. So thank you. It's really been a pleasure, Jean, to meet you and to have a chance to sell the plot.
Thank you for signing our copies. And Joe, it's always a pleasure to see you. You and I did a conversation a few months ago, but I'm delighted to get a chance to catch up with you. Great to be here. Yeah, thank you. You bet. So I want to thank everybody who's watched this tonight. Um, there will be a podcast of it available and it's going, the video is going to live forever on our Facebook page. So do recommend to people who miss book. Yep, um, buy the book and you can listen to um, the podcast and watch the video. And I'm hoping that Jean will send us a link to her wonderful programs because you know, Jean, um, Zoom is, Just yeah. bookwriter.com, it's all one word, bookwriter.com. Okay, but you know, Zoom was actually made for that sort of thing. So it's wonderful to think of the expanded audience and I will no longer sulk that I am not one of the 20 people in New York City that didn't have a chance to come and join you. Wow. I'm going to try to figure out a way to maintain some kind of a uh, an online element for the fall. Just today I, I had lunch with the woman who's just written this enormous Sylvia Plath biography and she's going to do an event for us in the fall. So How wonderful. There are a lot of people around the country who are going to want to be there for that. Well, it gives us something to look forward to. So good night, everybody. Um, enjoy the rest of your evening, and thank you so much for joining us.